How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. While risk assessment and emission projections can help us understand how climate disruption might hit our daily lives, they don't exactly inspire the imagination or provoke a personal response to the crisis. The solution? A growing league of storytellers who use photographs, films, and the human experience to breathe life into the cerebral realm of greenhouse gases. Images can tap into our senses and break down barriers that statistics cannot. But how far can they go to create positive change? Today, we explore the art of visualizing climate change with filmmaker Celine Casto, Academy Award-winning director Davis Guggenheim, and photographer Christina Mittermeier, creating a climate vision, up next on Climate One. Celine, your family is synonymous with oceans. Are you more passionate? And what were you doing? You were in the forest, which may be an unusual place to, for a Cousteau, maybe not. Um, but are you more passionate about sea life or people? Um, I'm passionate about the human story at the center of the environmental story, no matter what ecosystem. Um, I, I'm just as comfortable being thrown in the ocean as I am hiking in the jungle. Um, I, I like to think I have a fin on one foot and a hiking boot on the other ready to go. Um, I think the important part is really making the human nature connection, no matter where it happens. Yeah, we'll get into that. Davis Guggenheim, your dad won four Academy Awards for making documentary films, including one for remembrance of Robert F. Kennedy shortly after his assassination was shown at the Democratic National Convention. You followed, you followed in your dad's footsteps. And in the 1980s, when you were in college, you wanted to make a documentary about apartheid. What advice did your dad give you then? Well, I told him I was very excited. I was because I, I I admired my dad. He was a wonderful man and a great filmmaker. And I said, I'm going to make this film about apartheid. And he said, well, who's it about? I go, well, it's not about people. It's about this big thing. And it's this movement. And he's like, well, if you don't have a person you're following, that's really hard as a storyteller. And I've, I've kept that with me. He always said that people, when they're watching a movie, care about people. And uh, I've whenever I've uh, done that, it's worked out pretty well. Whenever I've forgotten that, my films get a little too far off and a little bit hard to identify with. I think um, I'm always trying to find stories that are universal, that can bring more people together. And if you can humanize almost anybody, there's a few people who you can't humanize, but uh, that, that really, I think, is a, a, great, a great thing. And, that's, and I, keep, I keep my father on my shoulder every day at work. Mm. In connection with humans and nature is a theme in all of your work. And see a lot of documentary films about climate change. I think they lose that human element. They're about issues and systems. And mm -hmm. Christina Biedermeyer, you say that we want to imagine wild animals accepting us into their world, a world where humans evolved for thousands of years. How do you think about that when you're ph photographing wild animals in their, in their habitat? It's an interesting thing. I enjoy so much uh, your comments, David and, and Celine, because it is true. It's about the human experience as a citizen of this planet. And most people are, for whatever reason, not in a position to experience that in the way that so many of us have, with a fin on, on one foot and a hike foot on the other. And a lot of people are afraid, frankly, you know, and I think we have raised an entire generation that is afraid of getting dirty or getting sick or whatever, and they don't go to nature. So when you can create images that allow people to imagine themselves interacting with nature, especially with animals, I think people just crave that, you know, the friendship with an octopus. Can you imagine? Yeah, well, that, that's quite, quite a film. Celine Cousteau, you talk about swimming near a humpback whale and it looking you in the eye and acknowledging mm. you. What is it like to come eye to eye with a whale? <laughs> um, you feel really small. And I don't mean just in size, I mean in importance. Um, because we are, we're tiny. I mean, human beings are tiny on this planet. We're just really numerous and, and impactful, which can be negative or positive. Um, but that moment that, that a humpback whale looked at me, I just kind of stopped in the water and just felt my existence. 
it's hard to describe and and you know touching on what christina says a lot of people either are afraid to or don't have the opportunity to get in nature but there's so many um there's so many moments in nature that really touch on the heart of what we are in this in this bigger system that we are just one species amongst others and that moment eye to eye with a humpback whale for me was just a, a, a stark example of it and a privileged one I lived in China in the early 80s, uh, or late 80s after college. And I remember the, so the classical Chinese paintings would always show these huge mountains and show the humans as, you know, very tiny relative to nature, which was, I thought was like odd to me. That's not, I hadn't seen that before going to to live in China. Davis Guggenheim, the poster for an inconvenient truth features a hurricane coming out of a smokestack. You know, what are the dominant images you think of that define the climate narrative? Well, it's interesting when uh, that poster was presented to me by Paramount Studios. I thought this is this is sensationalistic. It's um, over the top. It, the, the, in the trailer, it says the scariest movie you'll ever see, and I was really upset about it. I mean, I I went to the mat saying this is a terrible way to market this film. It turned out to be a really good way to market this film. So so I learned a lot. Um, um, I, when I made the film, I wanted it. I wanted the tone of it to be um, moderate and not political, and to reach as far to the middle and even to the right as I could. Um, so I that the, the the answer for me is well the the lesson for me is that marketing a film is very different than making a film and what your story is. But the the there's a lot of I have a lot of answers to that question, but I think for that movie, the images that seemed to resonate with people were the polar bear swimming in the water and, you know, putting its paw up on a piece of ice that was too small to find <laughs> um, firm ground and swimming away back into the endless ocean. People, you could hear people gasp in every screening of that movie. And then Al Gore was really smart about, at that point, reinforcing in almost every slide co2 marching up and it, how it would go up how you visualized it it's sort of imprinted but that's a that's more than 10 years ago and, and in a sense the, the the challenge is very different back then it was like is it real and do we understand it i think now the challenge is that further in this conversation but now it's about now that a lot of people believe it's real and that we're causing it now what do we do and how do we activate people so i think the images um might have to change um, yeah more solutions oriented which i think you acknowledge that there weren't a, there wasn't a lot of solutions and in inconvenient truth which was actually 15 years ago if i got it right this year so yeah i think i think the um the good the bad news is is that the problem the, the problem is worse than we imagined and the good news is now there are more solutions Davis Guggenheim, you've heard about test screenings of movies in which many humans die in a gunfight and audience are concerned about a little puppy somewhere in the scene. What does that say to you about, you know, human concern for, for animals? Yeah, about, yeah, we were talking about this the other day about how um, in my former life, I was a television director and you get these test results back and, you know, in, in the show where, you know, there's gunfights and people are dying and stuff, the audience doesn't care about those people even characters that you know, but they care about the puppy that the, the villain kicks on the way out of the bar, right? And um, I'd have to be have a degree to understand why that's the case. But I think do people do project a lot of their empathy and a lot of their emotions onto animals. Uh, and that's just something to understand. Uh, um, it, and I think also um, it's hard to um, connect to large groups of people I think that's the other thing I've I've learned is that if you say well, a hundred thousand people, but if you if you and Celine and Christina know this, uh, it's it's pretty simple. But if you if you meet one person, and you understand them, and you can find commonality, then uh, that, that, then you can then an audience can reach beyond even uh, you know someone who is who lives very far away from you and very differently from you. Well, Celine Cousteau, you've 
done that in the Amazon with your, your recent film, and indigenous people occupy rainforests and other lands that may be key to stabilizing the climate. And deforestation and oil extraction and gold mining are threatening their way of life in the Javari Valley in Brazil and elsewhere. You know, connect with us for the resource extraction in the Amazon. And how did you try to sort of humanize and make familiar these people that are seem to be exotic and you know, primitive, I realize that's a colonial term, but you know, they're frozen in time. How did you try to humanize and make them relatable for, a, you know, affluent people in rich Northern countries? Um, several ways. One is I actually listened to my mentors around me. Um, and despite the fact that I did not want to be in the story, I was not planning on being in front of the camera. I did place myself in front of the camera so that I would create a bridge um, so that the audience would follow me as somebody perhaps more familiar, mm. more accessible, mm -hmm. um, the neighbor, and follow me into this adventure and, and through me meet the people that affected my life. Um, I also chose to um, be more vulnerable than perhaps I would have wanted because the story wasn't about me, but I chose to actually film inside my home. I'm fiercely protective of my personal space. Um, but I thought it was important if I asked the audience to stretch their ability to create a connection with people they don't know that I had to let them in a little bit more than I otherwise would have. Um, so that's one way. Another one is that I didn't craft any of these scenes. Um, I didn't ask any of the indigenous people, no matter which village or which uh, tribe we were visiting, I didn't ask them to put together a ceremony or a ritual or ask them to go hunt. We really just followed the ebb and flow of their life. Um, and sometimes that means we may have missed out on the absolute beauty shot that would have made, you know, the scene in the film. Um, but I think it showed something much more intimate because it was authentic. And, and I think that at the end of the day, that shows in the film. Um, it's not the blockbuster, uh, big splash film. It's, it's truth. It's intimacy. Um, and some of it's ugly and, and some of it's beautiful. We're recording this show with a live audience and one question from uh, listener Lisa. Are there other films in the pipeline like My Octopus Teacher, which was about love and connection and a deep knowing of place? And this is, I, I think a lot of people saw this uh, film. I know that when my wife and I watched it, she would, people were just gushing about it. It was, it was amazing. Um, so Christina, tell us about the film a little bit and, and how you reacted to seeing it. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, Craig Foster, the filmmaker, is a dear friend and his wife, Swati, and I have been fellow warriors in many conservation battles. And so I knew that they were making this film. And the part that they struggled, and this is where I would love to get Davis's and Celine's thoughts, was how do you provide a call to action to people that are watching your film that's tangible and in the moment? And the octopus teacher was, yes, of course, about the relationship of this man with the, his backyard, this beautiful kelp forest and, and the octopus, but the, the deeper intention that they had was, you, you know, how do we use this to rally for protection? There is a devastating octopus fishery, uh, all these ropes have entangled so many whales and it's slowly cause, causing the demise. And that's where I want us to go as a, an artistic filmmaking community to being able to use the social media and the technology platforms, platforms that we have to build the larger community and the call to action that people can continue taking. And Celine Cousteau, it seems like the one thing that that, you know, there's a one to one relationship in that film that's very deep and beautiful. And that's very different than a lot of uh, nature documentaries, et cetera, where you see, you know, a charismatic megafauna briefly and then it and then it moves on. But there is like I mean, there I mean, there is intimacy between this exotic creature and this and this man. So tell us, your, yeah, your thoughts about my octopus teacher and what it illustrates. Well, so I think what worked really well there was, um, was that it was a relationship. And it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it was interest species, it was a relationship and, and you inherently understood that and you understood the love that was created, the admiration, um, <clears throat> the peace that, that was brought to him by, by having this contact with nature, the reverence he had for the animal, the understanding the animal allowed him to be in its, in its realm and its world. Um, the people that I that I have heard from who aren't in our in, in our circles, I'll say, of either filmmaking or nature or environmental protection, 
were in awe of it and they all felt it. So to, to kind of answer the question, Christina, as well of like, how do we get people to motivate to action? I think part of what we do in storytelling is intangible. And that's, I know for me, really difficult because we share a story with the world. We don't really know what they're going to do with it. And we don't necessarily at the end of a film just want to say, here's your to-do list. Um, because part of it is, is about shifting consciousness. And I think that that's something that's, it's, I know it's hard for me, um, but I have a filmmaker friend who years ago said this to me. He says, do not ever forget that one of your main um, focus and goals is to shift consciousness. And you may never know exactly what your films or stories have done, but you need to believe in, in what you're doing. Um, so there's no easy answer of, you know, putting a little PSA at the end of your film kind of breaks the magic of that love between this human and this animal. Um, I think people will follow up and they, and they do in, in their own ways. I know some people who are not eating octopus anymore because of the film. And if that's Yay. all that was done, I'm, I'm applauding it. Davis Guggenheim, uh, you know, there's the documentary films now are platforms for action, participant media and other groups are trying to, you know, use them to mobilize people and inconvenient truth uh, and, you know, awakened a generation. Your thoughts on my octopus teacher. In fact, you noted earlier when we talked that the man seemed to have a closer relationship with the octopus than his own son. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, they seem like a lovely family. And that was more of a question, not knowing anything. Yeah. The filmmaker's job first is to tell a story. I always like to think of the movies I make as, okay, what is the story outside of the issue that you're making? We always thought in Community Truth was a redemption story about a politician who lost an election and it was his mission in life to, to tell this truth that he knew. Uh, and of course, the movie had tons of charts and graphs and all that sort of stuff, but at the core heart of it, you identified with him. I think what's great about an octopus teacher, it's a love story. And like every great love story, love stories are always, the formula for love stories are the simplest of formulas, which is, you know, these two, these two, I would usually say people, but like these two um, organisms, you know, and they want to be together desperately. And it could be Dr. Shivago and it could be um, a teen flick, but a great love story are the obstacles that, that get in their way. They, they come closer and then the obstacles pull them apart. They get closer, and the obstacles that pull them apart. And, you know, what's beautiful about that movie is it just works as a love story first. And um, I think that's our job first, is to, is to tell that story that casts a spell on you. And uh, sometimes, not always, I think sometimes the message, and it happens in my movies a lot, the message breaks that spell. And so you have to figure out a way to also, um, to, 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 and I don't want to go on too long, but we had a great um, lesson we learned when we made Incommit Truth where we had no prescription and we showed people the film and they're like, well, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> and so we learned at the end to put uh, things you can do in the end credits. And that was a great breakthrough for us. So you're constantly trying, because I a lot of my films are about issues, but how do you tell that story and keep the spell from breaking and then give people what they want uh, once, once, you've, once you've cast the spell and they're asking for it. Our human ability to deeply absorb images of nature depends on how our brain receives them. Dr. Laura Sewell has taught us eco-psychology and environmental perception at Prescott and Bates Colleges. We asked her to help us understand how visual media connects us with the natural world. When we're sort of gazing into the natural world or in it, we're not cognitively trying to do very much. Whereas when we look at facts or graphs or lists of data or reading books about climate science, it takes a lot of cognitive effort. And we, for the most part, don't like to work too hard cognitively. It takes a lot of metabolic energy. We almost always want to choose cognitive ease. So if there's imagery that is easy to access and it's got these wonderful natural associations, we're going to absorb it more readily. Let's take advertising using nature to seduce us into buying a Jeep that will then tear up the terrain. 
there's no mistake there. There's an understanding that the associations are activated and we're feeling all sorts of pleasurable stuff and we want that Jeep too. But there's a lot of good work out there. Some of those Patagonia and North Face short story adventure films, they've got great footage. They show the reasons to be engaged, the wonder of the world. And in the background is the message of this being in peril, this adventuresomeness, this possibility. So here's great human potential, great experience. And just remember, it might be lost, but you've got all sorts of ability. That was Dr. Laura Sewell, author of Sight and Sensibility, the Eco-Psychology of Perception. Davis Guggenheim, you're interested in how the human brain perceives climate threats. How conscious are you of how nature's being used in the video and photographic advertisements that you see on screen? I'm, I'm, I'm just at the beginning of research on a, another movie about what I, what I uh, simplistically call the psychology of climate change. So I'm not really thinking so much about imagery. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how this heavy, heavy sense of catastrophe plays on all of us as we live our lives, especially on my own children um, and everyone's children. Uh, I think that's another angle into this problem. Um, well, tell, tell us about your, your son's 21st birthday. You bought him a, his first case of beer and it ended up in a, a surprising conversation about climate change. Yeah, so this is a couple of years ago. He was in college, it was his uh, junior year. And uh, my wife and I said, can we visit you on your 21st birthday? And he said, sure. And in, in America, when you turn 21, you can, you're, you can legally drink. And so it was, it was a big, really fun night with all his roommates, like eight of his friends. All, little mismatched tables pushed together and beer and take out Chinese food. And it was just the most fun I've had in a long time. Still, I, it's one of my best memories ever. But about two o'clock in the morning, I asked one of his best friends. I said, well, how many children do you think you'll have? This, uh, he, uh, this is uh, and my, my son's friend. And he said, uh, oh, I, I wouldn't bring children into this world. And then we went down the line and none of my son's friends uh, said they would bring children to this world, including my son. And the striking thing was that, um, but it was also the fact that very few of them talk about climate change. And so they feel this great sense of catastrophe, and yet they don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I want, I, I, I'm interested in how they carry that. And perhaps, uh, if there's a way to sort of unlock that and understand that, then maybe that's another angle into uh, breaking through on this really, in this really complex issue. Can I say something about that, Greg? Because I too have children of the same age and none of them want to have children either, which is no surprise, but they live very close to the issue through us, right? Through our passion. I noticed that young people feel in general so overwhelmed and disempowered and you know to deal with this a lot so i wanted to find a way of connect giving them an opportunity to be connected that was not a heavy lift emotionally or otherwise so we built a platform where you can tell short stories so it's very you know contained but they're emotional and they're beautiful and at the end of every story there's a call there's something that you can do right then and there you know it can be a sign a petition or tweet to a prime minister or donate five dollars to a community that sense of I've done my part is really important. And through stories, you can tell people, you know, this is what you contributed to. When they hear that it, they're part of a bigger community making a difference, I think it starts lifting that sense of foreboding doom. Do you think, Davis, I mean, there was a moment when we started talking about climate change, when the conversation was truly cerebral. And I feel like in the beginning, at least, it left a lot of people out. You know, people don't like to feel stupid. And it's just when you start looking at those graphs, you're like, oh, I don't get what they're telling me. You know, I'm just going to not think about it. But through song and through story and through photography, we lower the price of entry into the most important conversation of our lives. And like you said, Celine, we're all storytellers. And I feel that the stories that we're telling somehow are empowering people to feel included 
and we're giving them permission to become environmentalists, you know, to care about this issue. We need many more. I, I, I agree 100%. And I also think we need to be conscious of how the urgency is changing. Like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we needed to convince people that it was real. And then we need to convince people it's uh, that humans are causing it. <laughs> and then you want to convince people that this is the most urgent story of our time. It keeps going, right? The story and the barriers to understanding and taking full action keep shifting and understanding wh where people are in this sto story and meeting them there. There's a thing I'm always trying to crack. That's why I'm going back to my son and that sort of weird disconnect between him making a life choice about having children and then not talking about it. It's like, okay, there's something there. I'm always mm -hmm. thinking of where are people in this, in this moment. And um, then there's, and then there's something else because in the conversation about climate change, we often uh, don't talk about the biodiversity loss that's going with it, right? These two parallel things and they're, they're hand in hand. And the solution for a lot of climate change is going to be to protect biodiversity or to restore habitats. And so we can't leave that part of the conversation out and allow the Elon Musk's of the world to, you know, come up with a machine that solves the issue when we already have all the machinery on this planet that can solve the issue if only we choose to protect it. My own journey has been, learning has been from the literally outer space, learning about climate and the systems and the physics and the politics and the oceans and everything else. And the biggest systemic problem is between our ears right here, this system that is preventing us from understanding the other systems. Um, and then from the head to the heart, I think that was well said, uh, all of you. It's been a pleasure to uh, to talk with all of you. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team making this happen, especially our technical director, Adam Anderson, who's been with the Climate One 10 years next month. Thank you, Adam. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.